Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here and checking out the series. Ah, you know what to do. You like what you see, what you hear. Hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. I'm so excited today. Kiefer Sutherland back with a brand new record called, uh, do you say it, Bloor Street? Hello. Bloor Street is correct. Yeah. How are you, sir? I'm, I'm great, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well over here. Congratulations on this. Um, I'm, I'm guessing. So is this what you did with your uh, with your lockdown? Uh, this is part of what I did. I, I managed to actually do three films. Uh, well, two films and a limited series in, in the lockdown. Uh, you know, it's, it's easier to make a film during the pandemic than it is to tour. So uh, but but I wrote I wrote about three songs before the pandemic and then the rest of the record was written during the pandemic. Uh, and I, I found it really interesting. I mean, clearly this has been a really difficult, uh, hard time for so many people uh, and, and around the world. Uh, and I couldn't help but notice that a lot of the songs I was writing were coming out more positive and hopeful than anything I'd written in the last 10 years. And the reason was that I was kind of, for the first time in my life, stuck at home, I, you know, I, I stopped moving a 1000 miles an hour, and had to kind of take a look around. Um, and I was just so grateful for how fortunate I've been in my life, and how, how much I love my family, and how much I love and miss my friends, and how comfortable I was in my home for the first time, and gosh knows how long. And, and um, so I, I found that kind of curious that in kind of a really difficult time, uh, I experienced kind of hopefulness and gratitude. And, and I, I and I hope that really comes through in the record, because it certainly did to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you said, uh, maybe it was online or something. But uh, when you were talking about two stepping in time, uh, if there ever was a song I wrote for lovers, uh, yeah, you know, and it, yeah. kind of, it says a lot about what you're getting at right there, I guess. Well, yeah, it's it's, you know, the two stepping in time, uh, I was sitting with a friend of mine, Gary Briggs, uh, and my girlfriend at the kitchen island, and we had recorded a couple songs for this record already. And I was feeling good about those songs. And he said, You know, I, th I really think you should write a waltz, and uh, picked up the guitar and started kind of humming a melody. And the melody I came up with ended up better in four four time, and the lyric I wrote was better in four four time, so it didn't end up being a waltz, but its original version uh was kind of really a country song uh and and gary was sitting to my right and and cindy my girlfriend was sitting to down down the island and i figured i'd better write to her instead of him <laughs> otherwise it was going to be a long week wise uh, choice <laughs> and and it was very funny i just uh, i wrote a love song to her uh literally in 20 minutes and first verse and chorus at least. And then I finished the song over the next couple of days. Uh, and then when we went in to record it, you know, the band kind of had a really interesting kind of rock take on it. And, um, you know, and those kind of those eighth notes uh, on the guitar at the very opening of, of the song kind of reminded me of bands like the knack uh, mm -hmm. and kind of early car stuff. And, uh, I really dug that. And so the kind of the, the band helped the song kind of take its own journey. Um, but yeah, it started out as just a really simple love song. Yeah. It's interesting though, because there is still a balance on this record for all the love songs. There's a, um feels like at least to me as a listener that you get just as many out of love songs like i i specifically will point out like goodbye like right. as one of those ultimate tell-off songs when you when you put the record together do you think of it at all as a narrative no i think the closest thing i do <clears throat> to being outside of the moment of writing a song for the sake of writing that that moment is maybe i'm aware of the set list for a tour mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm thinking, oh gosh, it'd be really good to have a balls out rock song right now. And, and, you know, and so songs on the last record, like agave came about like that down in a hole came about like that. Um, this record was really kind of just kind of feeling things in the moment and, and kind of making a conscious decision that I didn't want to make a kind of historically accurate country record, like, uh, um, not Enough Whiskey was a song that I felt was kind of a, re a real tribute to old school country music. But I wanted to just kind of 
make a record with the band and kind of see what we came up with. And, and I felt it to be a much more Americana kind of rock record and f- felt it to be more melodic. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not really, I write the song cause I'm writing the song for me. And then kind of, if it fits in the collage, like we recorded 16, 17 songs, 11 made the record. So, so at, when the songs are done and finished, I'll start to kind of see what works together and what, makes sense in a kind of larger narrative um but not when i'm writing the individual song uh <laughs> clearly i can't handle two things at once so i kind of go one step at a time in the old days those leftover songs we would have called b-sides they'd be making yeah. their way out it doesn't really happen well, and, anymore but and a couple of b-sides you know one of them is just absolutely going on the road with us uh it didn't make sense for the record but it's a song called friday night and you know, want to drink some whiskey and find me a fight. Uh, no better way to start a show than that. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, speaking of thing, like, like this is your third record now. At, at some point, you, you've now made it to the point where you could have a greatest hits if you need it. You know, it's, well, I'd have to have to. a hit first, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there should be a rule. You should have at least one hit before you get to put out a greatest hits record <laughs> and fill the next nine slots with songs no one's ever heard. <laughs> Um, who else is singing on Down the Line? I, I really love that song. Uh, Eleanor Whitmore. Okay. Uh, and, and it's funny. I mean, I wrote that song because I, I have a couple of friends, but one specifically uh, that had just made some poor choices in guys kind of in her earlier years. And I couldn't help but notice that she was paying a price for that much greater than a lot of guys that I've known who have made poor choices in love in their early years. And I, and it, in all fairness, it pissed me off and I didn't think it was very fair. Uh, And so it kind of, that song is about just how heartbreaking it is for some, you know, for, for someone, particularly a woman in, in her early forties and just um, it's hard to start over, you know, in that situation. And so um but it was never meant to be uh a duet uh i sang the vocal and i don't know what i was thinking because gary briggs again uh my friend and chris lord algae uh who produced the record oh, yeah thought it would make a a really beautiful duet and then i heard her sing it and i was like oh my god what were you thinking why were you singing this song um you know, and then she also played violin on it, which uh, her track, her violin track, I just think really makes the song musically as well. So, um, you know, that uh, that was just a kind of got a lot of help on that song from yeah. a lot of people. It's got a little bit of an like an Irish folk thing to it uh, at the end of it. Well, yeah. And what's really interesting is I am acutely aware of where I am. Uh, I wrote that song. We were doing press for the second record and we were staying at a house in England on Henley on the Thames. And it was in an area that got us into London when we had to do press for that and kind of surrounding towns as well. So um, we were going in the pub all the time. And that's what we were hearing. You know, in the Mm -hmm. pub, they would have an accordion player and a guitar player. And that's the kind of music. And then all of a sudden you start writing songs that sound like that. Uh, So I it's a there's a real benefit to touring is because every time you get to another country or another place, if you're allowed to get out and, you know, get around the town, the impact that those, those songs have in whatever area you're in are significant. I think that's what a lot of artists have had, not say a problem, but an issue with on, on, you know, records that they have written over these last couple of years because of the lack of touring that so many artists have had to go inside themselves, you know, to, to a lot of, to their past. um, Right. Just to kind of dig up that stuff. Well, and it's and and so to that note, I mean, I thought what was so funny for me, and not funny, haha, um, but literally, I mean, I was doing Designated Survivor for three years in Toronto, Canada. That's when I wrote Bloor Street. hadn't been That's where I grew up. hadn't been home uh, for that amount of time since I was fifteen years old. Uh, then, in between that, for the last three years, we did five hundred shows on the road. Um, mm-hmm it's hard to kind of count the hours to the minutes to figure out how we had the time to do it, but we did. And so all of a sudden the pandemic hits and it's like a hard break in your home and you're not allowed to see any friends. You're not allowed to see your kids. I don't know what else you do, but be reflective, you Mm -hmm. know? And, uh, and I think for me, it was really long overdue. 
Yeah. Well, a lot of talk has been said about County Jail Gate, which before I knew what it was about, it was already a song that stood out, but more so in those, like, uh, I was thinking about when like Johnny Cash doing Shel Silverstein's uh, 25 Minutes to Go, you know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, how did it's... you approach that one? Because it does have that classic story style to it. Well, I'll tell you, I, I was watching a movie at home and uh, and the opening of the movie was a man getting out of prison. And they did it really well. And the gates started to open and the screeching of the metal and then the buzzer started going and the lights started flashing. And I had a visceral reaction, like I got nauseous. And I looked at the TV, I was by myself and I went, man, there ain't no sound I learned to hate more than the sound of the county jail gate. And a white bulb went off and went, wow, I like that. <laughs> off went the TV and I went to the kitchen island and started writing that song. Because it's true, I, I hate that sound. And, and the reason why is, is, first of all, you've made a really dumb mistake to be in this position in the first place. Mm -hmm. But when you hear that, that's it, it's done. There's no going back. There's no saying sorry. There's no, you know, you're going inside. This is going to happen. And, and whatever jokes and kind of way you kind of tried to toss it off your shoulder or whatever, that's all over. <laughs> this is the moment where you go, I hope I don't get in trouble here and, you know, pull my boots up and, and uh, try not to look anybody in the eye and kind of mind my P's and Q's. You go through a list of like how to get your crap together really seriously. And, um, and, and even now I'm laughing about it, but I'm laughing out of a kind of sense of embarrassment and, and absolute humility. I mean, for real, that moment, those moments, and I've gone to jail a few times. You just, you're so cross and angry with yourself that you've allowed yourself to do something so stupid and, and, and lazy. Like a thousand different choices could have made that not happen, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, and I don't care whether I'm talking about you know a drinking incident or a fighting incident, but there's a thousand ways to have avoided those situations, and it's pure laziness to not have. Um, and so I wrote the song about that, and and just this, there's a line in it that I really love: "Wasted times, what's on my mind? Because this ain't no way to live." You know, by the time you start singing that to yourself, mm -hmm. you're angry, you mm -hmm. know, and not at anybody else. This isn't anybody's fault. This is all you. And so uh, for me, it was important to write that because that's the process of beginning to kind of move past it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't aware of that until I'd finished it. Yeah. Well, it's a powerful so moment. So now I'm completely on the ready to get in trouble again. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck on that. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so, so bridging, you know, your two careers when I, when I was listening to the record and, and you know, your other records too, which, you know, we've enjoyed here at WFPK in Louisville Thank since you've you. been putting those out. Um, you know, when you found your style, what it sounds like, as you've talked about this Americana, you know, sometimes country and looking at your roles, do, do you find that you like those type of roles in the same way that you fall towards this type of music? Like, like recently, in the past few years, he did Forsaken, but of course, all the way back to Young Guns, when we think about, you know, the type of music that, that mm -hmm. fits with these movies. Well, you know, the sad thing for me, you know, and, and acting is the great love of my life, and this will be something as long as they let me do, I will be doing till I die, you know, to, as long as they let me. Um, but you don't get the choice, right? Uh, you know, 24 was something that I absolutely loved doing. Uh, the gift of a lifetime for an actor. Uh, and I love that character. When 24 ended, it, it didn't mean that I could just immediately go into something that was kind of in the same genre. And, and, and because that the development process of that takes years and, and having the right writers and all. So it's not like being able to sit down and write a song and, and say, well, this is kind of what I'm into and this is what I want to sound like. I'm in control of that. Mm -hmm. uh, which I find ironic given that, you know, I started music so late, but I'm in control of the way I want to sound and I'm in control of what I write and I'm in control of how I want that presented. Um, the acting thing, there's a lot, you know, even, even though I've been, you know, relatively successful, there is a lot out of my control. And so, you know, it's, it's like going to the grocery store, you know, on, on a Sunday, not the best day to get your produce, right. you know, um, <laughs> But sometimes you got to go on Sunday, whereas songwriting to me is like you got your farm, you know, and you just 
pick when it's ready to when it's ready to pick and you go forward like that it's and there's something very liberating about that um but yeah i mean i think for every actor if, if they could start just doing what they kind of were moved by spiritually and kind of creatively uh, the landscape of film, film and television would be very different yeah well i i will take the moment then to at least while i have this if you don't mind a couple of i mean Listen, when you did William Burroughs, and this is out of context, anything I think we're talking about, but uh, in Beat, yeah, how you embody that. Uh, I go back to that every few years. That's one of those movies that I revisit. Oh, thank you, man. Over thank and over. You. It's so well. Like, I don't think of Burroughs these days, and I'm a big fan, uh, without thinking of you. That's what it's turned oh, into. Well, oh, wow. Well, thank you. That's, that's an honor. Thank you very much. Um, I loved William Burroughs. I loved his writing, but I loved his, his life. Uh, I mean, aside from shooting his wife in Mexico, right. everything else about his life, I really respected. Um, because he just followed his own path. Uh, and, and they were trailblazers in the sense that in kind of late 50s, early 60s, they were, they were not only kind of an, an that beatnik group, but uh, they were creating a kind of writing and a style that was completely their own. Uh, but they were also figuring out a lifestyle, whether it was alcohol, drugs, um, fidelity, uh, sexuality, gay, straight. Uh, all these different things were were being experimented with, and I, and I and I think that that kind of questioning is really good and is really important. Um, and I just I never felt that William Burroughs lied. Mm. Uh, he was just a really honest guy. It didn't mean that I had to like everything he said but I at least respected that he was coming from a place of truth. Um, so I really wanted to play that character in that sense that I had a lot of respect for him. Um, and uh, yeah. And, 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 and you of the maybe nine people that have seen that movie. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's great. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with FDR. Uh, I share it with you that uh, as far as historical presidents, my favorites in that one. So mine too. I can't yeah. wait to see how that series comes about. Uh, that's, and... that's coming out in the first lady comes out in April, I believe. And me too. I mean, it was just, once you have the voice down, mm -hmm. you know, of, of a historical character, if you can get that and you can embody that, the rest is just so much fun. You know, and FDR had such a distinctive voice that it actually made it, almost, you know, kind of easier. So did it. So did William Burroughs, actually. Yeah. Like I said, that's uh, you were the embodiment of that one. So in the meantime, Blur Streets, uh, again, it's so much fun to listen to. Kiefer, uh, congratulations thank on this you. one. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to talk about it, too, man. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure, man. And thank you for your support. And, and just. Uh, the last time we played Louisville was, I think, the Bourbon and Beyond Festival, mm -hmm. and uh, can't wait to come back. Yeah, please we do. We visit, visited the Baseball Bat Museum more than once, so I, I, I think I'm going to need a tour guide <laughs> next time we're back there. But sure, uh, we can make thank it happen. You, thanks, brother, and uh, take care. All right, you too. We'll see you around. Bye. Okay.